Hey guys, I'm out here. I'm a bit of a mock survival scenario. I'm looking for some animal tracks. I'm really hungry. I gotta get some food. All right, I found a spot here. There's some animal tracks coming through this little section here. The only problem is all I have is paracord, which is pretty typical of a survival scenario. People carry paracord, they don't carry anything else, right? So let's set up a snare here. So we're just gonna do an overhand knot. Let's keep it really straightforward. So there's a noose, overhand knot. Gonna slide over the animal, right? That's the theory. Okay, so the animal's coming right through here. Take this, we'll get it the right height. Something like that. Just gonna tie it up. Okay, there we go, done, right? This is gonna work, let's have a look. So there it is, all set up, right? Animal tracks right through. Animal gonna get caught, right? It's gonna go through, set the snare off, right? Just right through. Okay guys, I want you to stick with me to the end on this one. I've got a special guest. Uh, he's gonna talk more about modern traps. We're gonna talk about survival traps right here. So many people think that this is gonna work, right? The animal is gonna come through like that and then somehow it's gonna hit the edge with their leg and then it's gonna come off and then it's gonna tighten down. The reality is that these snares are so much less efficient than modern snares that actually trapping something like this for, with this kind of set is uh, next to nothing. And I'm gonna explain to you why. First of all, the animal has to pull it clean out, has to get all caught up in here without backing up. You can see that the snare is not loaded. There is a type of snare using aircraft cable that can be loaded. It will slide down as soon as you touch it. This, because it's hung up in the branch in order to get it the right shape, will only work if the animal gets right into it and either goes all the way through or comes backwards somehow without coming out of the loop. But an animal, as soon as it feels anything against its skin, it backs out. It doesn't like touching anything. Okay, that's the first thing, the first problem. The second problem is, is it's, it doesn't, I can't set it where I want to. It's, it's limp. And because it's limp, I have to prop it up with sticks. So I've got to get a whole bunch of foreign material in here just to get it just right like that. If it snows, I have to come back and reset all my snares. But these ones, I have to set a certain way to keep them off the ground. And because as the snow rises, these become less and less effective, I have to raise up all my sets even more. And again, I run into the same problem. I can't just put them anywhere I want. Now let's presume that an animal, we've caught an animal, we've caught a significant animal that's gonna feed us, not a squirrel or a, or a rabbit. No, let's 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 assume we caught something like you know a coyote or maybe even a wolf that's going to feed us. Okay, so here's a wolf skull. Now, what I want you to notice about a wolf is the dentition on there. Check out the teeth on a wolf and the musculature. This big sagittal crest up here, that's for anchoring muscle through the jaw. Okay, what do you think? What kind of bite force do you think this animal has? Assuming it goes through and it starts to struggle and it gets caught around its neck, okay? What do you think the first thing it's gonna try to do? Back up, because it feels resistance, just like a fish in a line feels resistance. Now it's gonna reach back, and it's gonna start gnawing on what it feels as tension. That's your paracord. Paracord's gonna get wrapped up in the teeth. It's gonna start yanking hundreds of pounds of force, you know, on an animal like that. That's a wolf. Okay, a raccoon can do the exact same thing, and a rabbit for that matter. Let's see a herbivore. You think a herbivore is any different? Here's a deer skull. Have you ever looked at the teeth on a deer? They're sharp. Those are not dull teeth. In fact, these on a herbivore are sharper than the wolf skull. You run that, over top enough times and that line is going to start fraying. You give an animal a couple hours, it's going to chew through it. So if you're not watching your traps, what are you going to do? You're going to lose your animal. So that brings me to my final point. 
Maybe you're not using paracord, maybe using picture wire. You can catch a rabbit or a squirrel with picture wire, but you know what? A squirrel and a rabbit can chew through picture wire too. It doesn't work. It really doesn't. Now, this is a paracord trap and this is picture wire. I wouldn't consider those to be primitive traps. I would consider the ones that are engineered to go off, deadfall traps, pitfall traps, uh, figure fours, those kinds of traps as primitive. How long does it take you to set up one of those traps? Does the energy output that you get from it exceed the energy input that you get out, that you put into it? I challenge you out there to do that. Because I'm not an expert on modern traps, I'm gonna hand you over to a good friend, the meat trapper, Tim. He's gonna take it from here and he's gonna to explain to you what a modern trap looks like and you're gonna to have to decide what you wanna carry into the woods. If you can carry picture wire, paracord, why can't you carry a modern trap? Stay with me now. Meat Trapper himself will be following up to set the record straight about the kinds of traps that are best suited to living off the land and those that should be carried in a survival situation. But first, we must make a few things clear. While the distinction between an effective trap and a primitive trap might not be crucial to most people in our civilized world, they can become quite harmful to someone who finds themselves in a real survival situation, someone who is actually trying to keep themselves alive. Instructing people to use primitive traps is a recipe to accelerate starvation, when it is intended to do the exact opposite, and this is dangerous. Building primitive traps can quite literally accelerate starvation and bring a person without food closer to death. The point isn't that primitive traps don't work at all or don't catch game, in fact, natives were estimated to have run upwards of 300 traps per family to supplement their agricultural pursuits. The point, however, is that the world has changed and it is no longer possible to imitate primitive man and produce a net caloric return. If you really believe you can live off the land with nothing more than your bare hands and primitive tools, then you really are nothing more than a starvalist. A starvalist or starvivor is a term originally coined by me to help describe people who do nothing more than starve themselves in the woods while accomplishing very little by way of productivity. You must ask yourself, if you really want to stave off starvation in a survival situation, then why not pack along a few modern traps and some proper snares and give yourself a fighting chance? Given that I am not a trapper, and with the aforementioned in mind, I'd like to introduce the meat trapper. He has agreed to pass along his knowledge about trapping and the sorts of traps he uses to regularly put food on the table. These are the kinds of traps that actually work when trying to live off the land as a necessity. Just as natives have moved over to modern tools, so too should those who really want to live off the land. Anyone who has actually tried to hunt, fish, and forage their food on a daily basis will readily admit that any advantage available is worth taking. Thank you for the welcome, Chris. I appreciate it. It is a uh, cold, rainy day here in the deep south and uh, I got something I think everybody might be interested in that's the first uh, beaver that I've caught in a cage trap and that's uh, it's gonna be a whole different story but what I'd like to talk to everyone about today are the different classes of modern traps and what their advantages and disadvantages are so let's take a look Okay, now the first type of trap that most people uh, think about when they think of a survival or a preparedness situation is the snare. Now this is a modern aircraft cable snare and the most salient characteristic is that it's made out of aircraft cable and not cordage or paracord or picture wire or anything like that. Your cable comes in various diameters and various twists depending upon what animal you're after and what properties you want in the snare. This is a 1 16th inch diameter, 1 by 19 twist cable that has very different properties than a 7 by 7 twist cable um, in say a 3 32nd inch diameter. All of that needs to be taken into account when you select your snare. Now the important part of the snare is the snare lock. The job of the snare lock is when you make a catch the lock keeps the loop from opening back up and allowing your animal to escape. You'll usually have some form of snare support. I like to use a piece of vinyl tubing. This allows me to insert a support wire 
that holds the snare at the proper height to make a catch. Finally, you need a swiveling device. This is a heavy duty deep sea swivel. This one's rated to 600 pounds. I, I go all the way up to 1,000 pounds on my swivels. But once you make a catch, the animal is going to twist and twist and roll and he's going to kink that cable up and they can and they do break these aircraft cables. Once you see a thousand pound aircraft cable broken or chewed through, you'll realize just how difficult it would be to hold any size animal in a paracord snare. The advantage of a snare is that it's extremely lightweight. I can carry a dozen or two dozen of these coiled up, ready to go, and it weighs maybe a pound, a uh, pound and a half, depending upon the cable and the hardware that I have on it. The snare can be adjustable to catch anything from a very small animal up to a very large. So I can take the same snare and I can catch something as small as a mink or a muskrat and something as large as a hog or a deer. No other trapping device that I'm aware of can do that. So they're light, they're cheap, they're very adaptable, they work great in snow or icy conditions. If you get six inches of snow one night, your trap, if it's a foothold trap or a body grip trap, it's going to be buried. The snare just raises up a little bit. You can raise it up and it stays in business. So snares have a lot going for them. The disadvantage to a snare is that it's a one-shot deal. Once you make a catch, this cable is going to be mangled and twisted and you can reuse the snare lock and you can reuse the swivel, but you need a new snare. So it's a one-shot deal. Now the next type of trap that's commonly referenced is a conibear, or more properly called a body grip trap. Now these traps come in a variety of sizes. This is a 110 size trap, it's 4 inches by 4 inches square. They make some specialty traps that are even smaller and they go incredibly large. Some of my beaver traps are 12 inches by 16 inches, huge traps. And I even have some 660 mega bears that are, that are absolutely massive. But these traps are lethal traps. And so once the spring is set, once the trap is set, when the animal comes through and hits the trigger, the trap will close around its neck or its chest area, killing the animal. Um, these traps will last a long time. The first part of these traps that's going to give you trouble in a long-term survival situation is the triggers. The triggers rust and break, then you have to have a way to replace the trigger. Usually these things are riveted in, but that's uh, that's one of the downside to these. The other downside is that these things are fairly heavy compared to a snare. Um, I may carry two dozen snares in a pouch. You're not going to carry two dozen of these 110s in that same size and weight. And if you go to a trap that's actually useful for a wide variety, which would be a 220 or a 280 size trap, you're certainly not going to carry a dozen of those in your backpack with your other gear. For reasons of size and weight, um, I would not recommend a body grip trap as part of a bug out bag or any type of uh, survival planning. That's just my opinion. The final type of trap is a foothold trap. And with footholds, there are two types of footholds. You have coil springs and long springs. This is the long spring. And a coiled spring is simply a type of trap that the jaws are powered shut by a coiled up music wire spring. The advantage of this type of trap this, in my opinion, the long spring foothold trap is a generational trap. And what I mean by that, I've got these Sleepy Creeks that are 15 years old. I have never replaced a part on them. I have never done anything other than paint them. And they, they still catch food. They're still putting food on my table after 15 years. So the advantage is long-term durability. Another advantage is that just about anything that you catch with a snare or with a body grip trap is going to have feet. If it has feet, you can catch it with one of these. The disadvantage is, is you have to size the trap to the animal. If you are in a difficult situation, that's not always going to be possible. And so if you're going to carry a small trap, you're not going to catch and hold anything that's, uh, that's larger in it. So there are advantages and disadvantages to each one of these options, but I would have to say um, if I were putting together some sort of survival kit, um, I would go with snares, but that's just me. Well, I hope this was useful. If you'd like to learn more, look me up. Um, just uh, search for the Meat Trapper. You'll find me. And I would like to say thank you very much to uh, the Wooded Beardsman for allowing me to make a guest appearance. 
I have learned a lot from his channel and my hat is off to you Chris you actually get out there and you walk the walk instead of just talking the talk and that whole series that you did was just absolutely fascinating and revealing thank you very much and uh, we'll see you next time